Thank you all for coming out. It was a nice packed room. I guess people want to hear about failure and how things went wrong. <laughs> That's more exciting. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get to it. But before we do, I'm just kind of curious, how many people in the room uh, use Istio today? Can you raise your hands if you use Istio today? Um, all right, leave your hands raised. How many people have used Istio for longer than a year? Longer than two years? All right, lo longer than three years? Four? Wow. All right. Five? Wow, okay. Six, really? There's still a couple people. Oh, my goodness. Seven? All right. Seven? <laughs> oh, wow. All right. All right, vertical limit. <laughs> well, some of the... You can put your hands down now, yeah. Um, some of this pain that we talk about today is, is going to resonate with you, I guess. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the things that we've learned in the project over the last seven years or seven and a half years now. Um, and, uh, and I think it'll be useful just to see how, you know, what, what are the criteria that you look for when you adopt an open source project? Or if there are people who are involved in open source, maybe the, some of those learnings will be useful for, uh, for your projects as well. Um, so first we'll introduce ourselves. I'll, I'll let Louis start here. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Louis Ryan. Uh, I've been involved in the STO project since the very beginning, so I'm responsible for a lot of this train wreck narrative that we're about to go through. So apologies in retrospect, in advance, and uh, thank you for being here and lasting through a lot of that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and I'm Christian Posta, the global field CTO at, uh, at Solo. I've been working on Istio since January 2017. I got introduced to Sriram, who was at IBM at the time. Uh, started uh, digging around and, and really got interested in it. Um, I followed it. I've written some books on this topic. I followed it over the last uh, seven and a half years, working with customers, experiencing some of this pain myself with, with, uh, with our customers. And we, Louie and I both work at Solo. Um, we are uh, some of the lead contributors to the Istio project. You might recognize some of the names on this, uh, on this slide. Uh, and we are driving the, uh, the future roadmap for the project. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that we've learned, we want to bring back and, and make the project as, uh, as good as we can possibly make it. So this is approximately what the agenda will look like. We'll set some context. We'll go into some of the gory details and then talk a little bit about, uh, about what we're doing going forward. All right, so I know you all have seen this before. I think uh, a lot of the cloud native open source projects follow this, this hype cycle. Uh, the entire paradigm has been new, right? Um, and so what we want to do is just kind of, especially with Istio, especially with some of you all that had your, your hands raised, you know, five years of using Istio, you know these peaks in this hype cycle are probably extreme peaks, right? Uh, people were very excited about it, and then they started using it, and you know, then you got into this, uh, this little trough area. But I think our estimation is this is approximately, based on what we see working at, with customers, working the open source project, this is probably where Istio is today in the, uh, in the hype cycle. We've moved way past it, uh, the, the initial parts, and we've gotten to this point where people are deploying it, deploying it at scale, getting a lot of value out of it, and it's worth their pain of, of doing that. Um, just for a little context, this is what the seven years looked like. The project was initially released in uh, May of 2017. And about a year later, with a lot of fanfare, a lot of excitement, um, a lot of promise, was Istio 1.0 in, uh, in July 2018. We tried to follow 1.1 real quick, but it took about nine months later. 1.1 uh, came out. Uh, from there, we've seen some, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some of the architectural changes. 1.5, 1.6 was a milestone. 1.9 was a milestone. We'll talk about why. Fast forward up to, uh, you know, the CNCF uh, um, donation and more recently, the last two and a half years or so, uh, introduction of sidecarless data plane. Okay. So... Going all the way back to the very beginning, or for any of you creating projects today, right? We're going to talk about focus and vision. When you think about Istio and the promise of service mesh in the beginning, right? We said Istio would do four things. Connect, secure, control, and observe. There aren't too many products 
out there that claim to or try to do those four things. And one of the bigger problems in Istio was, like, those are the goals, those are the vision, but vision and focus are not the same thing. And if we had focused on maybe one or one and a half of those things, I think the project would have avoided some of the missteps that happened early on. And that, I'm as guilty as that as anybody. Like, we had ambitious goals. We wanted to do a lot of things. We're, there were a lot of real problems to be solved. But focus was perhaps something that was an issue early on in the project. Like, we, the earlier versions of Istio, Christian did a count, and it was like 48 CRs? 50. 50. Um, that's a lot of API surface for a lot of features for things that users would anyway end up taking multiple years to digest and consume. Never mind us to know exactly how they were going to use them from the get-go and ship them all at once. Right, so that's been a long and very during painful lesson and some of the refactors that we've gone through have obviously reduced or been more focused on how we try to deliver on that vision. Uh, and also some of that permeates into ambient, and we'll talk a little bit about how that got structured. So when we think about like focus and vision, right? You're gonna have a lot of vision. And I worked at Google. I worked on projects that connected, secured, observed, controlled. You knew the problems that they were designed to solve. I knew a lot about how they were being built at Google. But building those things at Google is not the same thing as building them for you all. It's radically different. And so a huge learning for me, right, was learning how to internalize that the things that I had learned that were important inside of Google were not the same things that were going to be important to you. Right? We had a solution that we had built out in Google over years before anything of Istio became open source that was solving Google's problems for those use cases and doing so quite effectively. But how we built it, how it was going to be maintained, how we were going to consume it, none of those things actually really apply. And so that was a big problem. You can just literally overwhelm people, right? You come out with a project and it does all these things and has all these features and people struggle to kind of latch on to the one thing that they're gonna find useful. And so you want a hook, you want a mental hook. You want something that when they start to do one thing and they get successful with it, then they're willing to do another. But if you ask them to do 17 things at once, you're really actually gonna struggle. And we struggled. Again, and it's still a question we get today. Right. I want to use Istio, what do I want to use it for? Well, I'm not sure about these things. I want this feature, I want that feature. And we now are trying to generally try to be much more focused with people and say, okay, pick one thing that you want to be successful with in your implementation and then move on to the next thing, whether it's a security thing you're trying to do, an observability thing, or a traffic management thing. So almost like every engagement we do at Solo generally starts with that kind of focus to just deliver incremental success. And the same thing applies to software delivery and open source software delivery. And then obviously, with not enough focus, right, you try to do a lot of things. If you try to do a lot of things at once, you're going to have quality problems. And boy, did Istio have quality problems, <laughs> which Christian is going to talk about uh, the 1.0. Right, so 1.0, uh, July 2018, there was a lot of marketing, a lot of interest and expectations going into the 1.0. Um, and like Louis was saying, when you get focus and you know what you're building, you're gonna start with that one thing, you have a better chance of building quality into that thing, right? And if you build quality and you deploy that, people are gonna be happy and you're gonna get a net positive result. They're gonna promote it, they're gonna to talk to their friends, they're gonna you know, make public statements about how amazing this thing is and it, it solved some pain point, provided value, right? And Istio 1.0 did not do that. Um, that fire is not big enough. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to get a big trash can. Um, Istio 1.0 did not do that. From, from the get-go, when you would download the binaries and install it, it didn't, didn't work. Following book info, the you know, classic book info uh, example, didn't work. Some the proxies would come up, maybe. The control plane. Uh, pods would start to recycle themselves. Um, you know, it just, it just didn't work. 
Um, documentation was, uh, was kind of lacking, you know, especially if you had large clusters, that, that didn't work. There was supposed to be multi-cluster at the time, that didn't work. So that, the goal of getting a net promoter, a positive net promoter out of the 1.0, you know, we didn't get that. In fact, we got the opposite, right? People struggled. They were saying, what, what, what is this thing? Um, and a lot of it had to do with, with the lack of focus. Like Louis said, connect and secure and control and observe. There's a lot of features in Istio. When we, when we first announced it, like there was a lot of stuff and it sounded really exciting and it sounded like all stuff that we, we need. Uh, but when you download it and start using it, you'd be like, all right, so where, what, what do I start with? I can do some traffic shifting uh, but now if I think about how many, how many get that into my enterprise and my organization, well, what is the most pressing thing? Where, where do I start? It wasn't very clear in, uh, in Istio 1.0. Uh, another part of that problem, that lack of focus, plethora of, of features, uh, was that organizationally, the way these enterprises were structured, they had silos, right? They had different teams that were responsible for different areas. Networking was a team. The security was a team. Uh, infrastructure, uh, application developers, those were all teams. When people initially took Istio or downloaded it, they're like, who was gonna run this? Who was gonna use this? Uh, it did some networking, it did some security. Uh, back then, we didn't have a cross-functional team that would you know, kind of take. The infrastructure team kind of looked after Kubernetes, started to bring that in. Was that the right place for it? Uh, it wasn't until either organically or a little bit later in the, you know, in the industry at, at large is that you know, platform engineering became a thing, platform teams became, became a thing, and that became a more natural place for something like this to fit. But back then, there wasn't. It wasn't very clear. So one of the key learnings, you know, if you're going to do a 1.0, 1.0 signals ready for production, you know, a nice marketing event, get come, people come look at it and try to get positive experiences. Um, know who your end user is. Know who your buyer is. It might not be the same thing, but you know, you gotta know who, who those are and, and target it uh, to them. Uh, between 1.0 and 1.1, there was about an eight and a half month gap. Uh, so that, that, that bad taste of 1.0 lingered for quite a long time. After 1.1, we said, okay, we need to have predictable releases. We need to get on a release schedule every quarter. And I think since 1.1, we've been, we've, we've hit that target. Maybe we slipped yep. once, but I think it's been pretty I think consistent. we had one, maybe two slips yeah. since then. Yeah. Um, and then you got to find ways to measure net promoter. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because a lot of work has gone into that on the SEO side. I don't know if you want to say anything more about this. No, I mean, the, the primary buyer is probably the, the most durable one of these. Yeah. Right? Like, you have to have product fit. Like, when we, we talk about selling products, like I, I worked in commercial enterprise products for a long time. Um, you need somebody who's going to be responsible for this software, take responsibility for it, install it, maintain it, upgrade it deliver it into the organization and justify why it's there. And that smear of use cases across organizational responsibilities was difficult to overcome. It's, it's actually still, in some cases, difficult. Right? Istio is a networking product, but our, in, in many respects, but network engineers are not our primary buyer, generally speaking. Right? They come in to consult during the, the onboarding of Istio. Um, and we're often they often speak a different language than the platform team. Uh, the same is also true for security teams sometimes, right? That depending on the tools that they're used to using. So like, just as the industry is maturing around cloud native and cloud native concepts in general, like you look at zero trust. Zero trust is still a thing that is becoming accepted standard and accepted practice in the industry. And there's still no unified real definition of what it is. So there's a lot of pollution of the definition that causes confusion in the marketplace and our Istio's version of that is not necessarily the same as somebody else's, so we often end up explaining things. Okay, we're gonna talk about architectural complexity because there was plenty. You can grab the... Yeah, I can. Um, so, you know, people have seen the typical kind of sidecar diagram of Istio, service A, service B, we've got two envoys, but then there's all this stuff down on the bottom. Pilot, and what, what, what's a pilot? 
or, or, or Citadel. And basically what we did is we took each of the functional concerns of the system, secure, connect, observe, and there were microservices of the control plane that were fulfilling the, the kind of contract into the data plane and acting as the control plane for it, but they were all segregated. Um, this means or implies operational complexity, right? There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different binaries that were running in the Istio namespace to make the data plane work. And if I would go to anybody who had installed it and ask them, what do these binaries do? They go, like, they make the data plane work. Okay, would you care if there were three? And they're like, well, if the data plane keeps working, no. And this is kind of probably one of the biggest architectural things and something we recognized pretty early on, but it was painful and it took probably about two years to work our way through this, is microservices are great. Like Cloud Native, we talk about microservices all the time. When you buy a product, let's say you go out and you buy a database product, do you care how many services are in it? Like, do you actually care if it's one binary or three or 20 or 27? You care if I have to maintain and operate every one of them separately, you care a lot. And so the fewer things there are, the fewer things that you have to operate, the less concern you have as an operator of this infrastructure. You're totally happy to run microservices for the services that you deliver because you're there maintaining them, they're core to your business. But the services you acquire or the software you buy, nope. Right, and so Istio, in that case, we confused what Google had done in terms of delivering a control plane and the infrastructure for it in a SaaS-like ecosystem to package software. Istio is packaged software, right? I mean, we don't have a little box or anything, but like it's like any other enterprise thing that you get and install, right? And so just giving you more microservices is not giving you the experience that you want as an operator or maintainer of the system in production. Um, so we went through this big refactor in 1.5, which was to take all the microservices and turn them into a monolith. Um, we actually did a, uh, an academic did a paper, uh, and there were a couple of blogs that went out around the time about the rise of the monolith. Um, and Istio was kind of used as the canonical example for this because we had over-delivered microservices where people didn't need them. Um, how many people care that the thing that's serving XDS to Envoy is also the thing that you know, is figuring out how to ingest information from the API server? Nobody, right? So we shouldn't deliver microservices and deliver them, particularly when we're shipping them to other people, unless there's a really, really strong customer reason why they should be shipped that way, right? Which is very different than, hey, it's easier for me to ship them, right? Don't confuse what's easier for me as a developer of software for what's better for the customer. So big refactor here. Uh, and this made it just easier for people to upgrade. It was just fewer bits, fewer things to talk about. Also, the names made more sense. Uh, a good example of this, uh, Mixer, how many people remember Mixer? How many people remember what it's for? <laughs> right. Mixer existed as a policy abstraction and telemetry abstraction layer. Its job was to take the signals coming from the data plane and coalesce them and massage them and then forward them on to telemetry systems. And also to take those same signals and to feed policy decisions back to the data plane to say yes or no to traffic. That pattern of abstracting away in particular policy wasn't, the enterprise wasn't ready for it. Right. Some enterprises had policy systems, things like OPA or like off-the-shelf policy systems weren't available in the cloud eco ecosystem. There was no OPA. Uh, there was no Zanzibar. There were none of those systems that you could take. Um, and so the, there was no value in abstracting them at all. Hotel pipelines didn't exist. So right, we, it was an abstraction without a use case at that point. It had a use case inside of Google, right, which was scalability and performance. right, and it had those things, but that use case didn't exist for consumer or you know, the enterprise market, but we shipped it anyway. So we had to unship it, which we did. We just 
literally took it out, killed it, got rid of it, and all of the APIs that went with it. Um, so this is just an example of being, yes, maybe somewhere down the road there is utility in enterprise for a system that does this, that gives you four nines of reliability in front of your policy system when your policy system has two. But that's not where the overwhelming majority of users are. So don't ship an abstraction that your users don't need yet. Even though their, that need may exist three years from now or seven years from now, you do not need to ship it, so don't. And we paid the price, we had to unship it. Uh, and then the other big one, and right, is that sidecar pattern. Now, we didn't really have a choice at the time, maybe, to ship something other than the sidecar pattern. Like, we evaluated a lot of technologies to implement the data plane. Envoy was by far the best candidate to do it. And we didn't really have engineering budget to go build something else. Right, so this is a kind of a, a version of pragmatism, but it did come with a cost, right? People right, who have used Istio in production or used other service meshes that use the sidecar pattern are well aware of the operational overheads that sidecars present. And they are non-trivial, this complexity that existed. So that's an example of, okay, a necessary evil perhaps, a, a very useful one, but something that we would have to deal with in the long term. And we actually recognized this quite early on. We're gonna talk a little bit about ambient mesh in the future. And we started shipping ambient mesh and the prototypes for it two years ago leading up to the GA that we announced last week. But the discussions about this pattern were happening three or four years before that because we were well aware, we had gotten a lot of feedback like uh, the 1.0 debacle, we were, we got a lot of feedback, <laughs> justifiably so, right? So some key learnings, right? If you start out with a complex architecture, it's gonna lead to complex solutions, complex user experiences, complex engagements, and that's usually not good. People don't buy microservices, right? When was the last time you bought, like you're running microservices, but when was the last time you went and bought a piece of software or a solution, and if it wasn't microservices, you wouldn't buy it. Or you bought it because it was built with microservices. Show of hands. <laughs> don't care, right? You want the software to work, to be easily maintainable, to do what you want. I don't care if it's three services or two. Maybe I just, I just want it to be no services at all. I never have to operate it. I'm just gonna go get SAS. Don't build for something that's so far in the future that you may never even get there. Like Mixer was just way too far out over the skis in terms of what people were willing to use. And probably the biggest one and the one I'm most guilty of, certainly early on in the project, is I conf confused my experience for what your experience was gonna be. There's a bunch of stuff that I did, here's a bunch of stuff that I was used to doing, I knew that it worked in one context, and I applied that to something else. And I got a lot of feedback about that and had to adjust how I thought about these things. And that's probably been the, the thing that's been the most useful to me over the years is okay, like here's the list of mistakes that we made, we're gonna go and fix them, which we have done or continue to try to do. Um, so yes, yeah. Christian? Yeah, all right. Okay, so now from an open source project perspective, Right. We see some of the architectural decisions. We see, obviously, 1.0 had an impact on, on perception and, and reality. Um, now, for people who wanted to contribute to the project, because the project had Google backing it, IBM, Red Hat, VMware, all of these you know, had, a, had a good mix of top name vendor you know, atta attached to the community, there's a lot of interest in, and people wanted to contribute. People wanted to join. Um, and so that was not a problem. Some, some projects do face that problem. How do you get enough attention? But SEO did not have that problem. But now, getting people to contribute is, is one thing. Getting them to contribute meaningfully or, you know, being productive in the project is a different thing. One of the things Istio probably shouldn't have done is, is adopt the shiny new stuff at the time. Um, I don't know how many of y'all remember Bazel as the build system. If you, are, if you looked at the Istio code, uh, Bazel was a relatively newer uh, build system. 
not familiar to if you were coming from other languages especially and it had a high learning curve it had it presented some hurdles for people to get involved in in the project um, this idea so envoy was also new and up in you know in the early days of istio was still evolving and changing uh, the idea of configuring a network proxy like this like a like a um, you know Nginx and HA proxy, you know, a lot of those were flat file, you know, reload the, the flat files. Configuring it dynamically over an API was still kind of a new idea. Especially, you know, you had to know Envoy's API pretty good to configure it correctly and deal with that API interaction. Sometimes you, you get undesired behaviors there. Um, and so that presented another level of, uh, of, it was new. People had to figure it out. Uh, we talked about the architectural complexity, the number of moving pieces. Uh, one thing that was happening in the early days of Istio, especially when we were going from microservices to the monolith and, and other things, was the refactoring that was happening in the code base. There was a lot of churn in the code base. And so when new users would come and try to you know, learn Bazel and figure out Envoy and do all this stuff, and they would submit a PR, it was quickly outdated because you know, a lot of the maintainers were in the middle of refactors. And so that you know, didn't... It wasn't a good feeling to throw, throw a PR out there and it's completely outdated, you have to redo it. Um, and so getting uh, pro productive and meaningful contributions to the project lacked in the, in the beginning. Getting other vendors involved, like I said, there was uh, a lot of interest in the beginning. Um, and we did, have, uh, we did have folks and other vendors involved. I think one thing that Istio did do well is try to establish a governance model, an open governance model. It wasn't part of an open foundation at that point, but getting governance in place to make vendors or help vendors feel comfortable contributing to the project. Istio established a steering committee, um, a technical oversight committee, and weighted the, the seats on these committees based on <coughs> contributorship. How much are you participating in the, in the project and contributing to the project? will determine your you know, seats on these, uh, on these committees. Uh, one thing that was pretty clear is that the other clouds were not going to get involved in Istio, unless it was at an open foundation. Um, you saw they went and, and built their own meshes, actually. And that actually caused other, other vendors to also build a, a mesh. They were uncertain. You know, saw all this complexity, uncertainty around the project. Uh, they were going to go try something uh, as well. Um, now, it's interesting because Google, who owned the trademark, decided to donate it to an open foundation, the Open Usage Commons. I don't know if you all remember that. Uh, the challenge was Google also owned that foundation. <laughs> um, so it wasn't exactly what the other vendors were hoping for, and they made that known pretty loudly in, uh, in, in public. But Istio did make it to the CNCF. It was donated in the fall of 2022, um, over five years after the project had been created. Uh, it eventually made it into a graduated state in July 23, um, and, uh, but, it, but it caused a lot of friction during those five and a half years. Um, but we're in, the, we're in the foundation right now uh, in a graduated state and, um, you know, you did see then the other clouds kind of react to that. For example, Microsoft stopped working on the open service mesh. Um, Amazon, you know, I think they deprecated app mesh. Um, so, you know, it did have some effect on the, on, on the market for not doing that. Key learnings that, you know, the complexity of the architecture impacts productivity. Um, if you're expecting other vendors to get involved, you should, you should also expect to set up an open governance model, put it in a neutral foundation, make it you know, uh, reasonable for them to, to, to jump in without worrying about you pulling the trademark or changing the license or that kind of thing. Uh, we're running up on time here. But overall, uh, like Louis mentioned, we want to be focused. We want to deliver quality. We want to get that net promoter, a positive net promoter. Um, to do that, we kind of have to um, ship what we know will hit the use cases, the, the value that we want. We might have to say no in certain cases. Don't invent use cases. Don't assume that you, you the maintainers, are the buyers. Uh, on the user side, you all are buying into a vision. 
you're, you're buying into, hey, what could be? Do we think this, this will work out? Um, and along the way, you know, there's going to be, there are probably going to be bumps in the roads, right? The, uh, the hype cycle will go through that, uh, through that, um, those peaks and valleys. I do want to leave time here for uh, covering some of the, uh, of Istio's future though. So there are probably, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that we learn in terms of like how we operate as a community, how we like drive the project forward, how we do decision making, governance, so on and so forth. There's also just like the fundamental things like Istio is still a technology. How do we continue to remove complexity from the system? Well, obviously there's been a lot of talk this week about Ambient. I'm not gonna go into a ton of like the architectural details. There've been plenty of talks about that. But Ambient represented or represents a continued commitment of the Istio maintainers and community to continue to drive simplicity. We think Ambient is a more maintainable, easier to consume version of a service mesh for most use cases than the sidecar based one. So that's why we did it. And the one thing you could say is, okay, we've been doing Istio a long time. The one thing you could say about the community is, despite all of the missteps and the pain and those other things that we had, we stuck at it. Like, if you want to do something fairly ambitious in the industry, you're not gonna do that overnight. Right, yes, you may hit the peak of the hype cycle in three months or six months, right? But you're talking years, right? I, I've been doing Istio eight years, nine years. I'm gonna probably run up on a decade of Istio pretty soon now, and my wife's very tired of hearing about it. Um, <laughs> but it takes time. And you, you have to be able to be willing to go through it. Um, there's also just don't, don't invent things you don't have to invent. I, I put ANSI up here as a joke, right? Standards. If there's a standard that is relevant to what you're doing, it's better to use it than try and create an alternative, even if it's not as good necessarily, or it's not as comprehensive. Or it's like, there are so many definitions of what good means. Standards often mean accessible or just understood. Right? It's a thing that people already understand, so they don't have to learn something new. Like, we're committed to the Kubernetes Gateway API. Not because it has more features than the Istio API. It's because it's a thing people are more likely to understand long term. There's more aggregate investment and intellectual effort going into learning it. There are more situations. You're more likely to know it if you start using Istio if you'd used that beforehand. And then, just say no. There are so many things that we did in early on in Istio that we could have said no to. You know, building features for things that users didn't need yet. Building integrations into other systems to please partners or potential partners when there were no actual use cases for those things. Like, there's lots of opportunities to say no, and actually, you should take most of them, generally speaking, or you should just say yes very slowly particularly if you're developing an open source project, right? Have that focus, say yes to a small number of things, find a way to make some set of people happy. Don't try to make everybody happy at once. And then you can start growing that circle. But if you don't say no, you're gonna make pretty much everybody varying degrees of unhappy from the get-go, and that's what Istio experienced, right? And we spent a long time recovering from that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, okay, so we are basically at time. We got Two minutes. Um, I do want to direct you to ambientmesh.io, which is a community curated site focused on ambient. Uh, Istio.io is still the official documentation, but you know we've had feedback about the intermix of sidecars and non-sidecars. Well, this is a sidecar list focused uh, set of docs and getting started. We do have maybe a minute. We'll take maybe one question or two questions. We got a question right there in the blue. So the question was, with Ambient going to GA and that being incompatible with sidecars, will we be up here in five years saying that that was a mistake? No, no, we'll wait seven. <laughs> but um, no, 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 no. <laughs> so we absolutely intend to ship compatibility. So 
a mistake in timing, perhaps, right? But the intent is absolutely to ship that. So I don't think it's a, a mistake in that respect. It may absolutely be a mistake that it was a timing problem. I don't know. Like, I will continue to make mistakes, and that may absolutely be one of them. But it's something we do plan to remedy, just like there are other things, right, in Ambient, the GA, that right, there is difference between it and the Psychers. Um, we've tried to do our best to deliver a holistic product that we think works and will meet requirements based on a lot of interaction with users, a lot of testing that's already been gone through. So we've had a lot of fairly positive feedback, at least try to make sure that we got that net promoter feeling. And in particular, people who had used Istio for a long time in production actually migrating to Ambient and giving us feedback about that. So you're absolutely like timing. We may be completely wrong about what should or should not have been in the GA. You do have to get out there, right? You do have to GA, right? That's the one thing is if you stay in beta forever, so we gotta we gotta wrap up. Time's out. Uh, appreciate the question. We can talk more in the in the hallway out there. Thank